going? OK. And how's the homework going? So, I mean, OK. All right. Uh, going at a non zero velocity? Or Ow! Not, yes, slightly. Positive? Slightly. <laughs> slightly. <laughs> OK. Um, it's increasing. OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, well, then you still have a good amount of time. Um, this and, weekend is not good for people to uh, Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Football weekend. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, football Let's season starts. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, I probably, I think I might be inclined to go because I don't know about the, the late start time. Yeah, like, like when, I, 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 you have to like sit around until 9 p.m. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. I want to like go stop by the tailgate and be like, yeah, USM, and then like leave. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's a good plan. Like, actually, that's that's a good plan. Actually. <laughs> get some yeah. free food. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, oh, and actually, that reminds me, um, and I should have brought this up earlier. One thing that Corwin and I have been talking about is having some sort of welcome to the new year event, welcome graduate students event, um, sometime like and. Like we talked about, you know, maybe a one for weekend or something. Because uh, a couple of years ago we did something like that where we had a, a cookout at uh, Paul Johnson Park. Um, so we're looking for faculty and graduate students to go to, but we need to figure out uh, when um, something like that would be. Um, and uh, I've I've been really talked to uh, Corn about it lately. And uh, so, for instance, um, maybe something on the Weekend after Labor Day. Um, I'm at it now. Mm -hmm. Oh, you are. Yeah. Oh, you're there anyways. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> yes. okay. I mean, I'm just one bird's on my so. Okay. Um, I mean, I need to put feelers up more generally than that, um, and I'll probably talk to Corwin about it again. But it's something to think about anyway. That we really do want to do that, and you know, Dr. Schwartz is like, hey, you know, the department would pay for it, and um, I'm pretty sure it would. Uh, so. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> no. Um, I know, like, the thing is, like, my old apartment at Stanford, like, they'd be at least a party a month. Like, for instance, even just something like for whoever has birthdays during that month, uh, they'd uh, get some food together and stuff, but no, we, we don't do that. So, um, And uh, also, uh, you're aware of the science student chapter meeting, that'll be after analysis. Um, uh, it, actually, in the same room, so you can just stay there. Um, and there'll be uh, six thirty, uh, and there'll be a uh, uh, and there'll be pizza at that. Um, so, come on now. Um, and you know, we have money for the chapter has money for activities um, and ways to get more. So, so there'll be stuff going on. Um, okay, um, now um, oh, that's on the video. Oh well. Uh, so I think um, after I cover uh, what I. Plan to cover today, which is the start of uh, chapter two, um, and that'll be so. So these problems in today's notes, uh, that that kicks off the next assignment. So don't think about them yet. Um, but I, I think we should have time at the end of class for um, if you guys have any uh, specific questions about the um, homework. We can we can do that. Um, and also, there's always the option of emailing me or or whatever. Okay. Um, now, the thing is, of all my research is in uh, differential equations, um, it's really more about numerical methods for solving differential equations. And it's not really ordinary, but partial differential equations. So today, this is the closest we get to that. Um, most brain-dead numerical method for solving an ODE, or system thereof. Okay. Now, um, this is something I want to emphasize because it's something that a lot of people mess up. How we pronounce this, it is not Euler's. Of course it's harder. Like, yeah. Duh. Yeah. And, uh, um, Euler's uh, numerical method. Um, in fact, this is one thing, it, it, it just drives me nuts, and I, so I have to mention it since his, his name has come up. Um, 
And uh, actually, he is one of the most prolific mathematicians of all time. There's many things named after him. He published like 800 or so papers uh, in his lifetime, which is just insane. I mean, it makes me feel like a schlub. I have 20. Um, so, um, of course, he got to he got to invent all the stuff that we take for granted today. So he kind of had it easier. But anyway, anyhow. Um, uh, so um, on a well-known and still running uh, TV series, um, uh, Rizzoli and Isles, based on the wonderful murder mysteries by Tess Gerritsen, um, his name came up. Uh, so the actress uh, uh, Sasha Alexander, uh, as Isles, referred to um, Mueller's formula that relates the three most important numbers in mathematics. Yeah, so um, <laughs> Euler's formula. So, so you can imagine when I'm watching this, I'm like, my the big vein in my head's about to pop. And <laughs> Euler's formula uh, relates the five most important numbers of mathematics, E, I, pi, one, zero. Um, so, and if I had the inclination, might have like written an angry letter to them or something like, "How could you do this, you bastards?" And, um, but I'm sure somebody else did because there are people who have time for that sort of thing, and I'm not one of them. So. <laughs> okay, um, so Euler's. Uh, I, I've, I've mentioned this before, and still some students don't say Euler's. They're like, "Are you trying to kill me?" Well, <clears throat> okay. Um, now, um, so we're looking at a typical first order dynamical system. It uh, doesn't matter whether it's um, autonomous or not. And actually, it's for uh, any initial conditions. So this is for an initial value problem, or IDP. So here is our initial condition. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, so one way we can get an understanding of how, how Euler's method works and why it might be effective is to think of it uh, geometrically. So here we are at point um, x naught, um, the uh, initial uh, the initial value. So what this uh, system of ODEs is saying is um, if we uh, is that the tangent vector at this point to our solution curve is the vector big X of T naught and then X naught. Um, now, I'm going to call this point, let X1 um, be equal to the value of solution x um, at t naught plus h. Right. So we're taking a small step forward in time, um, and that uh, step is of uh, length h. Um, then how are we going to get from this point to this point? Uh, so from this picture, we can see that our new point x1 is equal to x0 plus um, h times our tangent vector. Um, so we have uh, t0, x0 plus in here, and we get our new point um, x1. And I should say, really, this is not exact. This is an approximation to our new point because um, since the solution is not it's necessarily a straight line solution, only if it's a straight line solution would uh, the tangent vector take us exactly from x naught to, to our new solution point x one. Um, but if, a, if it's truly a solution curve, uh, nonlinear, uh, because there's going to be some uh, extra terms. Now, I'll be able to show you what those extra terms are in just a little bit. But this is just giving a geometric feel for what the um, uh, um, for, for, for what the uh, new point's going to be. 
And then from x1, we can do the same thing. We can reevaluate the tangent vector at this point uh, to go to a new point. So we can say x2 is equal to x1, and we're still st stepping in time the step size h. And then our new tangent vector would be evaluated at the time uh, t1, x1, where t1 is equal to t0 plus h. So, so what we're doing is we're actually updating t and we're updating x. We're updating them together. Um, so uh, in general, what we can do is we can say xn plus 1 is equal to xn. So our new point is our previous point plus um, the appropriate uh, multiple to be a tangent vector. We plug in the current t and x values into our vector field in order to get the new tangent vector. But then, in order to, we also need to update time. And that's we're just incrementing uh, time by h. Um, so we just keep repeating this process as many times as we want until we arrive at whatever our, our final time is. Okay, so questions about um, why the method is what it is. Um, now, what I can do to uh, give a better justification, because we're no, we know we're stepping from x0 to x1 or x1, x2, and we know we want to use this tangent vector as a direction, um, but I'm going to make it a little clear as to why this is the correct multiple of that tangent vector to take us from one point to the next. Uh, the easiest way to see it is to um, rearrange um, this equation. So, um, actually, I'll go to a fresh board for that. write this as xn plus 1 minus xn, so move it to the other side, now divide by h is equal to x of tn of xn. Um, now, um, this whole expression, um, well, it means approximating. Well, this is an approximation of the exact solution of at time. So here's our approximate solution. Here's our exact solution at time tn plus h minus the exact solution at time tn all over h. But this expression, okay, and this is Um, so we have this approximating this, but this expression here, um, what is this an approximation of? What, what, what does this remind you of? It's a derivative. derivative, yeah, it's exactly the definition of derivative. So this is an approximation of x prime at tn, which is supposed to be exactly equal to the vector field at tn xn. So, so really all we're doing is you can look at it this way. Here's our exact system of ODEs. We replace this time derivative by this difference quotient, and then all we do is rearrange. And then we have exactly Euler's method. So it's based on this simplest approach to approximating a derivative that gives us Euler's method. OK. Um, um, now, uh, to, so, so 
one question that would come to mind for any numerical method, and you could say that what I'm about to do for those of you who uh, may be taking um, Math 561 next semester, where we get into numerical methods for ODEs, and we will revisit Euler's method and see way better methods. Um, and those of you who took you know, 461 previously, um, this would ring a bell. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of error analysis. Just have an understanding of how accurate uh, Euler's method can be. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to represent the exact solution as well as I did over there. Um, X of t. I, I use R of t in the notes. I've been using R often as notation for a solution curve just because it's often done in the calculus classes. Um, but I'll just, I'll just stick with this and write um, x of t here. Um, and often at like time tm. Our approximate solution is I'm just using the time level as a just a plain old subscript. Okay, so, so this is meant to be an approximation of this. Um, so, what I'm going to do is, the approximate solution comes directly from Euler's method. So I'll go ahead and fill that in again. Okay. But the, what about the exact solution? Well, that would be the exact solution at time Tn plus H. And that is equal to by Taylor expansion, so that's what I'm using here, is uh, x of tn. And then the next term is similar to this, so it's h times the vector field at tn x of tn. And then we're going to have uh, one more term. I'll just stop at the next term, because we don't really need to go any further than that. So that's uh, Shoot it on our room. One half h squared. I'll, I'll compact it a little bit. H squared over two x double prime at some unknown point um, c n, where c n is between t n and t n plus one. So this is just Taylor's theorem. Um, that's uh, going on right now. Actually, I need to move that for video people. Okay. Um, now, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a variable representing error. So the error is going to be the exact solution at time tn minus xn. Um, just as a shorthand. So what that means is, um, if I go ahead and subtract these on the left side of this minus this, so that's going to be e n plus one, and then on the right side I'm going to have exact solution at time n minus the approximate solution at time n, so that's e n, um, and then when I subtract these two terms, I have a vector field at the same times, but the solution values are different. So it looks like I can't simplify these just yet. Um, okay. Um, and then um, we still have this um, second derivative term only from the exact solution. Okay. Um, because I want to have a clear understanding of the relationship between the error after n steps 
and the error after n plus 1 steps. How much error is committed from one step to the next? Um, now, I actually can simplify this a little bit more if I have some assumptions I can make about the behavior of my uh, uh, vector field x. Now, so before we go any further, here's the assumption. Here's the assumption again. I'm going to assume that my vector field x of t little x satisfies, and those of you who are taking 560 will definitely appreciate this. And actually, this the term may have already come up in real analysis. If not, it definitely will. Good old Lipschitz condition. Has it come up in analysis? Probably not. No. It will. Trust me, it will. <laughs> um, this condition in the x variable. Um, and what I mean by that is um, the vector field. Now, the t dot argument is going to remain fixed. Um, and that's what we have over there, um, so that's fine. And since these are vector quantities, I have to use vector magnitude. For instance, like Euclidean length of a vector um, is less than or equal to some Lipschitz constant L um, times the uh, uh, difference between the, argu the second arguments, uh, x and y. Um, and in fact, one way we can interpret the Lipschitz constant, assuming that the vector field itself, uh, big X, is uh, differentiable, um, that um, this uh, Jacobian matrix of of uh, big X, uh, at least partial derivatives of big X with respect to these variables, not T. We don't care about T in this. Um, so it would be double bound in that Um OK. Um, but now this is not absolutely necessary. Only, only this is. So if this is true, and this is a common assumption, like when we get to um, existence uniqueness theorem later on, this is the kind of assumption we'll need to make in order to establish that there's a um, uh, a solution that exists and is unique for a uh, dynamical system. So if I go ahead and apply this over here, I have the following, that the magnitude of the error after n plus 1 steps is less than or equal to 1 plus h times this Lipschitz constant L times the error after n steps. So for 1, I got from right here, and then I have plus h, and then this difference is less than or equal to l times the difference in in these arguments. But this minus this, that's the error after n steps, exactly. So, um, okay, I can leave that there for now. Um, so that's why I get away with this. And then I have that other term, h squared over 2 times the magnitude of the second derivative at the um, uh, unknown point. So, so what happens is there is some limited magnification of the error from one step to the next. But at least that magnification is uh, bound in terms of uh, h and also whatever this um, Lipschitz constant is. All right. Um, now, I'm not going to go further with the error analysis at uh, this point because, uh, and actually, 
when we get to this topic, for those of you who take uh, 561, I will go through all the gory details uh, there. Um, but this. Did you that in 561? Yes, we did. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this can be used to show that as h goes to 0, um, the uh, error, uh, so the difference between the exact solution and the approximate solution um, goes to 0 also. Um, and the error is big O of h. Um, in other words, the magnitude of the error is bounded by some constant times h. Um, and okay. um, so we say, and because it's h to the first power, we say that this is first order accurate. Which is not really all that good. Um, we like higher order accuracy, like the error is proportional to h squared, or better yet, h to the fourth, or h to a zillion, um, or an exponential function of, exponentially decaying function of h, that's what you'd really like to see, but it's kind of hard to get. Um, but this is a very simple method, um, so um, this is what you expect. But it's not hard to modify this a bit to uh, at least get um, uh, order h squared uh, accuracy. So it, it's a start. Um, so 561, we would get more sophisticated numerical methods, but um, this is what we're, um, this gives you an idea of how they work here and how you would at least start to uh, analyze them. All right. Um, now, um, I, uh, so, so one thing I, I, um, I've added to the notes, um, and it's kind of hard to present on the board, but I will refer you to the notes for this. Um, so I actually have some uh, MATLAB code, which probably would not be very difficult to convert to like Sage code, to uh, uh, if, if, you, if you prefer to use that, for a few things. One is um, an implementation of Euler's method. So you can make up a function that describes your vector field, big X, uh, like that describes your time derivatives, and then you can pass this to a function I have in the notes for Euler's method that would go ahead and carry out Euler's method from time zero to a designated final time. You specify what um, h is, um, and also you specify your initial condition. Um, and then um, what I do here, so this is what I have on the um, uh, second page of the notes, uh, where I have a case where the exact solution is supposed to behave like this, uh, circular. Um, I, actually, I should hold this up to the camera. Um, okay, video people look on page two of the notes because um, I don't think you can see this. Um, okay, you can kind of see it. Um, but it's supposed to be this behavior um, where it's orbital because um, this is an example where we have uh, several vortices where the velocity becomes infinite at certain points. So near those points, we get this circular effect. Um, but I only got this by um, uh, choosing h to be small enough. In this case, I had to choose a pretty dang small, like 10 to the minus fifth. Um, and here I use larger values of h, which runs a lot faster, but like the circle doesn't close in this case. Here it almost closes. Here it's really close to being a, a closed curve, but if I let this run further, it would start to spiral out. Um, and uh, so the smaller you make h, the closer it is to the behavior you're supposed to get. But that's the problem with Euler's method. You have to use such a tiny time step in certain cases in order to uh, get a solution that behaves the way you want. Uh, more sophisticated methods, you would get the proper circular behavior even with a much larger uh, value of h, and then it would um, be uh, um, it, you, you would get it a whole lot faster. Um, so, um, so uh, you when it comes to computational expense, like anything else, you get what you often you, you get what you pay for, but either you should um, invest in either um, 
and getting an implementation of a more sophisticated numerical method um, that will save you computational time later on, or if you just pull something simple off a shelf, okay, it's, it, you can get started getting solutions quickly, but it may take your computational resources more time uh, to get them. Uh, so how small does it take to be five? Uh, well, that varies in the problem. Uh, so, so the larger the time, so, so basically, well, I, actually, you can kind of get an idea um, from this that the, the larger your time derivatives are, the smaller h needs to be in order to keep that error in check. Um, and this is a, a huge problem because, for example, uh, suppose you're solving a two-equation system, uh, which actually what I, was doing, uh, what I was doing in the example. I had sinh y for one time derivative and sine x for the other time derivative. Well, sine x is bounded between minus 1 and 1. So that time derivative is fine. I would not need a small value of h to deal with that. But that sinh is exponentially growing. So um, if I'm way out there in terms of x and y, I would need a tiny, tiny h. And the thing is, that constrains how you're solving the whole system. You can have a huge system of equations, and most of the time derivatives are pretty benign. But if even one time derivative shows a lot of growth, you still got to use a tiny h, because usually all those, time, all those components of your system are tied together. You can't separate them. Um, and that's why I actually devote a lot of time in my research to finding ways to separate them so that you don't have to use a tiny time step because of one troublesome component. Um, but that's really hard to do. Um, so um, this is what's called um, an example of uh, really the most vexing kind of dynamical system. It's called a stiff dynamical system where you have some components that are not changing very much and other components that are changing very rapidly. And it's the those rapidly changing components that tell you what H you must use. Um, and that, that imposes the harshest constraint on H, makes it, forces it to be smaller. So then, even though the solution of the system might not appear like it needs a tiny H, you still have to use it. Because otherwise, your solution that you compute will be useless. It won't reflect reality. So far, this is not ideal. It's terrible. <laughs> but a lot of people still use it. They, they, they think, oh, OK, I have a supercomputer. Um, I'll just quickly implement Euler's method. I don't have to get any other off-the-shelf software or something. I'll just code up a quick Euler's method, and I'll just uh, use a minuscule a value of h and let it run for a month. I don't care. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, I don't like the attitude, to be honest, because like, well, if you um, would use uh, have some knowledge of whatever methods are out there, you could um, save your own computational resources and get your answers a whole lot faster, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um. <clears throat> okay. Um. Uh, but this is what happens in a lot of the applied sciences where they have a people, researchers in those fields have a working knowledge of the math that's involved. They've heard of Euler's method, they've heard of other very common methods, like the first ones that I'll mention in, in 561, and that's all they know. They may not have an awareness that there's something better, and then researchers like myself who are to, working to develop a better mousetrap, like, hello, hello. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, it just drives me crazy. <laughs> hmm. Okay. But that's also why I'm trying to have my research branch out into at least certain specific application areas, because then maybe at least researchers in those fields might be more aware. Um, uh, because I was in petroleum engineering before, and a lot of work I did there I'm hoping helped raise the level of mathematical proficiency in those yeah, fields, yeah. even though I'm no longer working there, mm -hmm. but from collaborators I've worked with and so forth. Um, you know, so all you gotta do is get certain people's attention, and then they start yeah, doing things. Right. Yes, yeah. Um, no, because I, my first time going to a conference in petroleum engineering, I hear one, like, one of the senior researchers of ExxonMobil giving a talk. And I'm like, he's doing some numerical linear algebra things. And I'm like, what's he doing? That's crazy slow. And I go to the microphone and like, practically embarrass him in front of everybody. It's like, 
I, I, I have my moments, yes. <laughs> but I'm nice about it. it was just, but, the, but the thing is, like, then one of his colleagues, like the numerical analysis team leader at Exxon, comes to Stanford and gives a talk, and I bring up the same issue. Like, you're still doing this, aren't you? Come on. And then they start bringing it up. Uh, so I don't know if I ever got through to them, but it's like, dude. You know? <laughs> okay. So that's numerical analysis in the real world. Um, so, um, okay, um, so you can look at the notes for um, more information about uh, uh, like, like you know, the code for implementing uh, order method. And, um, and actually, once you have a solution that order method computes, it's quite easy, as you can see in the notes, uh, to um, plot it. So, okay, um, so that's topic number one um, for today. Um, that's a section 2.1. Um, and then the other topic, um, back to analytical things. Um, certain kinds of vector fields um, have a more interesting behavior than, than others. And we'll talk about those today. are called uh, gradients, also known as conservative uh, vector fields. These are actually covered in um, our multivariable calculus class, uh, MAP 280. Um, but you guys have plenty of time to forget that, or maybe it was never covered in your particular edition of it. Um, okay, so a vector field, uh, big X, is a gradient vector field. If it um, can be shown to be a gradient, of uh, some function uh, f. Uh, so, so big X is uh, is a vector field of n variables, um, and f is a scalar value function. It takes in n variables, um, but only has uh, one output. So the idea is. Um, so I'll write this out in a component by component basis. Each component function of x is equal to a partial derivative of f with respect to the uh, i variable. Um, so you take a gradient of that, you look at the components like, oh, that's my vector field x. Um, it's a gradient vector field. OK. Um, now, um, so there's uh, two questions to answer. Um, if you're given a vector field x, but you don't know if it's a gradient vector field, so you want to ask, is it a um, gradient field? Because um, I was too lazy to write gradient vector fields. And we also call it conservative. So if um, uh, if, if big X is um, is a uh, um, <clears throat> okay? Um, if it represents some some force field, that's usually where the term conservative vector field comes about because it satisfies some conservation relation, like conservation of energy. Um, Is that what, what goes on in the electric field? Or the yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, uh, you can derive the law of conservation of energy, um, like um, from. If you're, if, if you're dealing with a conservative uh, vector field. Um, so that's something I do in multivariable calculus. Um, and, um, and then if you know that it is a gradient vector field, there's a way to check, I'll show you in a bit. Um, what is a function f 
so that big X actually is a gradient um, of F. So can we recover that F? Um, now, more terminology, the function F is called a potential function. So we'll go ahead and um, uh, get these questions answered, and then, well, we'll be done for today. <coughs> well, actually, none of us will be done for today, because you have analysis, and then I have a SIAM meeting Yay. after analysis. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of pizza, because... Right. No, it's not a lot of pizza. Let's skip lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes you sound so bad. Okay. Uh, no, because we once had an organizational meeting, organizational meeting for that club and uh, advertised a bit and quite a bit and had pizza on hand, a lot of it, and nobody showed up. Oh. And I was like, oh, thank God, these students are burned. Um, so, yeah, we, we've been burned. So, um, so I'll be having two pizzas on hand, two pizzas on hand and some breadsticks. <laughs> Get your carb on. Um, I could seriously carb get like one of those boxes of pizza. Right? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> or you could wait. Or you could share with friends. I mean, like, mm -hmm. no, work. Okay. Oops, gotta fix this. Okay. All right. So to answer the first question, that's the easy one. Um, so if the i-th component of your vector field really is equal to partial vector respect to xi. Uh, suppose I take this and differentiate both sides with respect to um, the j variable. So, um, so well, I'm going to assume that j is not equal to i. So partial of big xi, the i-th component, with respect to xj must be equal to the second partial of f with respect to the i and j variables both. But this is also equal to partial derivative of j component with respect to the i variable. Uh, because that would also lead to this, because the mixed second partial derivatives are equal. So what that means is, in order to have a conservative or gradient vector field require that the partial derivative of each component with respect to a different variable uh, that, we be, that we are able to switch the indices for all i and j from 1 to n, i not equal to j. Well, i equal j is kind of moot. Um, okay, so um, now another interpretation of this that's specific to uh, the 3D case that the curl of a vector field must be equal to the zero vector. So that's what, how it works out in that case because um, having these conditions satisfied is equivalent to saying that the um, is this cross product that the curl is defined by um, is a, a zero vector, but that's only defined in three dimensions. <clears throat> okay, so you go ahead and verify that for a vector field you're given, and if it's not satisfied, it's like, okay, there is no f. Um, it's just not possible to have that um, happen. Um, the curl would be the cross product of the gradient and the um, potential function? Uh, well, in this case, it's a curl. You think it's a curl of a vector field. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it is a cross product of the like the del operator, like del. ddx, ddy, ddz, and this. And this. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. For those of you who might remember that from multivariable calculus. Um, okay. But so, in however many dimensions there are, if this is satisfied, now how do we get the f?
Um, now, there's a rather painful procedure that's described that's usually described in, in textbooks um, that is uh, actually fairly similar to what I already covered with um, solving exact equations, um, because it really is a similar idea. But I, can, uh, I think a more friendly way for, for procedure is the following. Um, because since your unknown f satisfies this, that the partial with respect to each of the i variables gives you the i components, uh, what you should do is integrate. What was that? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's actually about the sign up meeting, so. Oh. Um, integrate. Well, actually, I don't know if I should mute that, but okay. I don't want to mess up the recording or anything. Um, okay, integrate each um, component of a vector field with respect to the i the i variable. So the x component with respect to x, y component with respect to y, z component with respect to z, and so on. Um, and you add on as a, basically your plus c, but it's not really a constant. It's going to be, I'll call it like some unknown function that depends on um, all the other variables. So the idea is, I'm purposely skipping xi in here. It depends on everything else. Um, so you add on the appropriate cost of, cost of integration. So that's for the role that it's playing. It's your plus c, but it's not actually a c at all. Um, and the idea is um, you take all of your antiderivatives. And you set them equal to each other. Um, and because uh, so, the idea is each one of these antiderivatives that you get is a representation of the same function f. So they all have to be equal. You just, but you set them equal to each other to figure out what are these supposed to be. Uh, there will always be an arbitrary constant in them. Uh, but um, this way you can sort out like what terms um, don't immediately match up. Because what will likely happen is some terms you'll be able to see right away they're equal to each other. But what about the rest? Um, so you have to um, sort out what all these are. Okay. okay so what I'll do now is um, show you how this works by um, stepping through an example. And the thing is, when you're taking your components and integrating them with respect to the appropriate variable, um, some integrations are definitely more difficult than others. And we're actually going to keep that in mind um, with this problem. So here we have our vector field function of two variables. Okay, so our x component is some constant a plus the so a and b are constants. Um, and then our y component is okay. Um, so the idea is we want to take this one and integrate with respect to x, and we want to take this one and integrate with respect to y. Okay. Um, now, um, so let's take a look at that, uh, these two integrals. So we will have 
a plus b y squared minus x squared over x squared plus y squared squared dx. And then we also have minus 2bxy over x squared plus y squared squared dy. Okay. Now, um, the first one seems to start out easily enough. What's the first thing you'd have? Yeah. Yeah, we have ax um, plus b integral of all the other stuff. And that kind of looks like a monstrosity. Um, so we're going to hold off on that for the time being. Because um, actually, working the upper one is going to help us. Because, well, first of all, in the numerator, in the second one, um, I could, I'm going to pull out the, um, uh, actually, we're integrating with respect to y, so I'm going to pull out a, v, a minus vx. We still have 2y over x squared plus y squared squared dy. Um, yeah, what can we do with this one? This one's actually a lot more palatable than the other. Instead of y squared, because the integral is at 2y squared. No, y, y squared over 2, really. Um, so like u is equal to oh. y squared? Yes. Actually, u is not just y squared, but what will be easier? x squared plus y? Yes. x is a constant. It, because that way, we got u equal x squared plus y squared. The du is unaffected. It's because I assume you chose y squared, because then you get du is 2y dy. Mm -hmm. um, so then this becomes minus bx, and we get the integral of 1 over u squared du. Um, so then we go ahead and, um, OK, so then we get uh, bx over u plus some unknown function of only x. And then we'll go ahead and. Uh, replace the u. So it's going to be bx over x squared plus y squared uh, plus some unknown function of x. So this is what we know so far about our potential function, uh, big F of x and y. That's some function of x plus bx over x squared uh, plus y squared. OK. Um, now, um, let's take a look at, because, oh, I goofed up here. That's supposed to be a dx, not a dy. Okay. Um, now, let's take a look at this. bx over x squared plus y squared. Um, okay. Um, so partial of f with respect to x is derivative with respect to x of bx over x squared plus y squared plus psi of x. OK, so um, how are we going to differentiate that? What we're going to use? There's a quotient rule. Quotient rule, unfortunately. OK, well, let's do that. So that's going to be x squared plus y squared, derivative of this, which is b. Um, minus bx times the derivative of this with respect to x, which is 2x, all over x squared plus y squared squared, plus the derivative of this, which is psi prime of x. Now, if we simplify this, we get b times, we have x squared minus 2x squared. So we get y squared minus x squared squared plus psi prime of x. And if we take a look at this, this is supposed to match 
this, the x component of our vector field. And, well, it essentially does. Um, the only thing it's missing is that, well, psi prime should equal a. Um, so by, sometimes by backtracking, uh, that could be helpful to resolve the uh, potential function. So if, if you're not able to work out all the integrals, but you're able to work out just one of them, then try going backwards, differentiating with respect to a troublesome variable and mashing it against your integral. Um, and that turned out to work. Uh, so that's a backup plan in case straightforward integration seems difficult or you don't have easy access to Wolfram Alpha. 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 Okay. Um, so, uh, so now we can go back up here. Um, all right. So our final conclusion is f of x, y is equal to um, ax um, plus this, bx over x squared plus y squared. Because now when you differentiate this with respect to y, the ax just goes away, and then this uh, becomes your y component like you would expect. So this is what you're after. Well, plus a constant. Um, one thing I, okay, what's the step I left out at the very start? What, what should I have done before I did any integration? Check. Check if it actually is a gradient vector field. So what I should have done at the beginning was differentiate this with respect to y and this with respect to um, x. So all right, so derivative with respect to y of this must equal derivative with respect to x of that. Um, it's too late in the day or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you got to use quotient rule for both. Um, yeah, but evidently it would check out. <laughs> so since if it checks out, then we go to step two, right? Other than that. Yes, um, yeah. So, so unless you are told, like in Get, unless it's a given in a problem that it's a gradient vector field, yeah, you need to make sure uh, that it is because otherwise, like none of the integrals will, will work out. So be careful about that. This is a pretty painful exercise when it's all for nothing. Okay. Okay. Um, so questions on this ugly exercise? Um, actually, this is, well, so the thing I like about this example is that it, it doesn't really work out in a straightforward way. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes that happens. Um, because it's, um, to, cause it's to see that the integral of this with respect to x um, really is this. That is not at all obvious. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes that happens because of the, you have something where you have a straightforward derivative that ends up being simplified, and some details of that derivative get obscured by the simplification. So when, you, so when you're trying to go backwards and integrate, it's like, how on earth are you going to get that uh, from that? You could suspect that there's going to be an x squared plus y squared in the denominator. But to see that the numerator goes from this to just bx, like, you wouldn't expect that. Um, but sometimes, uh, so, so, so the thing that's good about this example is it shows that really because you're integrating multiple items, you can use any of the ones that you can do as like a back door to figure out the rest of them. And unfortunately, sometimes that really is the most efficient way to solve a problem if you don't have nice, powerful integration software um, Okay, um, since there is some time left over, um, would anyone like to bring up any homework questions?
while you're doing that. So I want to make sure you have this in your in your notes. Um, that the reason I box these things is these two things I box are supposed to match, and that's why. Um, so we're making sure that, and that's how we see that side prime is equal. Um, because um, the derivative of f with respect to x must be equal to the x component of the uh, vector field. So this is an artifact of partial f with respect to x equals big, um, x1, partial f with respect to y equals x2. And it's because of this, this is what... Um, So, and this is what led to the integrals in the first place. Because in fact, both of these integrals are supposed to be um, equal to f. Because this is x1, which is supposed to be df dx. This is x2, which is supposed to be df dy. So then by, un so by integrating, all we're doing is undoing the differentiation of f with respect to whatever variable to recover f. But we get two different representations of f that now we have to reconcile. So since we were only able to do one integral reasonably, um, we did the reconciliation backwards. Say, oh, here's our a version of f. Let's differentiate instead of integrate to make sure it matches. So you can do that. So as long as there's one integral, you can work out. You can figure out the rest. Yeah. So it's like if you have an n component vector field, because you have n integrals, you basically have n chances to figure out the problem or n ways to get f. And you don't need all of them to work. One is enough. So it's sort of counterintuitive. Leave one at the halfway and then do substitution. And yeah, in a way it's kind of more realistic because sometimes yeah. that's, that's how problems are worked out. It's like, right. well, you just got to do what you can. Right. And actually, it's because of an example like this where it's totally not intuitive and you would integrate and get that. Right. That's why I prefer numerical integration because they don't care. Um, they don't care how complicated the anti derivative is. Okay. Any homework questions? Okay. Um, we're thinking about 1a again. Like you, uh, which section? 1.51a. Yes, that is a vexing problem indeed, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So, we, what, what we were thinking about, um, I don't know if this is the right way to go about it. Um, if you, uh, the, it says what? Definition in the 1.2, it's way back in section 1.2. You know, if so such a curve alpha is also called a solution curve of the system. You know, yeah. So, can we sort of play with that and use it um, here as, as part of the second order system? Um, yeah, because that's, that's the idea. Because the definition of 1.2 that applies to a first order, first system, order system, yeah. And the thing is, what is it that makes okay, if you go back to okay, this is definition 1.2 solution of system. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, so, what are the conditions? Um, in that case, we have right. alpha of t has to be in a domain of a vector field. Right. Um, and um, but the most important condition right, right. is this alpha satisfies the differential equation. Um, that, that's, what, that's what they're saying with alpha prime is equal to x of alpha. Right. Um, that alpha of t is able to play the role of little x. Um, right. Yeah, because little x in a dynamical system, x, little x prime equals big x of little x, 
That's too many X's. Um, yeah. yeah. I probably should just change all this notation, but whatever. Um, so um, little x represents all possible solution curves. Alpha is one solution curve of those infinitely many. Um, and uh, that happens to satisfy some unspecified initial condition, but it's just one of them. But all the solution curves have to satisfy a differential equation. So that is what you take to this problem, this uh, 1a, is you want a curve alpha um, that satisfies the appropriate differential equation. Then in this case, it will not be just alpha be, you know, for x double prime, because it's not the, uh, the first order system anymore. Where right. The solution curve yeah. almost to like a second yeah. order. Yeah. So you're specifying a condition on alpha double prime. Right. Because it's second order. Right. Right. So you can use these, right? Like a, a function. Um. Oh, wait. What are you looking? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And if you want, you can express it in terms of components. Um, but both of us not absolutely necessary. But um, yeah. But, um, yeah. But the idea is, yeah, you're, you're giving a definition. Okay. Okay. And um, I guess the way I was explaining to someone earlier is, in part A, the idea is you give a definition that just intuitively makes sense. How, you know, you're stating precisely what it means for alpha to s satisfy the appropriate um, system. Then, in parts B and C, you are showing that that definition is consistent with what it would mean to be a solution if you took the second order system and went to the trouble of converting it to a first order system and using the definition 1.2 to solve that. So is that notion of a solution, which we already have, completely equivalent to the notion of a solution you're defining in part A? Right. And so parts B and C are meant to check that. It's if and only a thing. So you check in one direction and the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's what we Yeah. Um, it is, it's, you, and I, I couldn't really fault anyone for saying it's kind of overkill, um, because there isn't really a lot of mathematics involved right. in this. Right. It's about just. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you can always take a higher order system and say, well, we're not even going to express a solution of that directly. We're just going to reduce everything to first order and always solve those. Right. But it'd be nice to have a concept of uh, solution for just the higher order system, um, at least have a definition of it. Um, and so you're cutting out the middleman, basically. Um, because also it's nice to have solu solution methods. Because even though you could always do a first order system, think about this. In your first differential equations class, you probably spend time studying second order equations and solution methods for those right. that were specifically for second order. Even when you never had to do that, you always could have described them in terms of first order systems and solved them that way. But that probably took more linear algebra than your instructor wanted to bring into it. Um, and it gets pretty tedious. Um, it's an interesting exercise to show that those methods for first order systems are equivalent to methods you learn for second order equations, like using a characteristic equation and quadratic formula right. and all that. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite illuminating to see how that works. But if you just want to solve the equation, it's like, oh my god, you know, <laughs> it's like, do you really want to use that much linear algebra? Um, now, I, actually, I believe that we will be looking at those kind of things in this class. Right. Later on, because we are, what are we? This class is mostly about first order systems, um, but um, yeah, it's I, I put that problem in there because it's important to be able to see how definitions are constructed and and, um, and making sure that two related concepts really are equivalent to one another, and um, because those are important things to be able to do generally in, in, in mathematics, but as a it's very different nature than the mostly computational problems you're seeing elsewhere in your assignment. But I like to give variety. Right. And I was thinking, yeah, I'll just do the same thing. Just, you know, just convert this to a second order thing and then find out, well, I didn't know if we had to find out after double time, but now we're going to use the you know, definition of 1.2 and hopefully. Yeah. 
Alrighty. 